This interview today is brought to, with Dr. Ian Fairley, is brought to you by the Samuel Lawrence Foundation in conjunction with the Coalition for Nuclear Safety. It's with great pleasure that I now give the mic over to Dr. Fairley. Hi, Kathy. Uh, thanks Hello. for that kind introduction. Um, let me explain that I'm a Canadian although I'm living in London, in England right now. Um, and as Kathy mentioned, I have worked and studied in the United States. I have very, very many American friends. I, um, I still have warm feelings about the United States. And I was very happy about the, recent, the results of the recent elections. Now, I'm going to cover five main things here. And I'm going to just skip, just give you headlines as to what they are. Um, the first matter is I'm going to talk a little bit about safety and what it means to, um, about living near a nuclear power station. That means, and the obverse of safety is risk, and what that means. Secondly, I'm going to be discussing what is radioactivity and what is radiation, the difference between the two. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to be discussing what the main risks are uh, from San Onofre. Fourthly, I'm going to be discussing how we get from what the discharges are at San Onofre to what the doses and risks which result. It's quite complicated. Um, finally, uh, I'm going to be saying, well, what can we do about all this? And then after that, some questions and answers. Let me say to you that I'd, I'm more concerned about answering your questions rather than me getting across a whole pile of information, which may or may not be what you want. First of all, if I can return to what the title of this talk is, is it safe to live near San Onofre? Well, to answer that question, one has to look at the risks involved. And risks have two prongs. One is the hazard or the harm to to individuals. And secondly, um, risk means a risky thing, means the probability of damage. Um, we have to, when we use the word risk, um, it, it tends to mix up these two concepts, but we should untangle them. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about uh, radiation and radioactivity. The trick here is to because many people get the two mixed up, is to talk about radioactivity first and to say that um, there are, roughly speaking, about 3,000 radionuclides, that's, that is, kinds of atoms which are, whose nuclei are unstable. That means that sooner or later they disintegrate, and when they disintegrate, they give off energy. And that energy is called radiation. So we go from radioactivity to radiation. And it's the radiation that's, that we're mostly concerned about here. And how do we get from examining the amount of radi radioactivity which comes out of a power station and figure out what the doses are and what the risks are? Well. That is a $64 question. It's extremely complicated. You know, many people say so-and-so thing is, uh, is easy because it's not rocket science. Well, let me tell you, this is rocket science. It's really complicated. Um, the best thing I can do is say to you, there are five models involved. Um, the first model is to figure out how much of the uh, radioactivity is actually created inside a reactor. That's called the source term. Um, so that's based on models, by the way, uh, from computer models from theoretical physics, radio physics. That's the first model. The second model is to look at um, the amount of radioactivity which is spread throughout the environment. And that means looking at weather, winds, rain, um, it means modeling the transport of radionuclides um, in the local area. 
That's the second model. And there are a fair amount of uh, uncertainties involved there. But it's of all the models involved, it's probably the least contentious. The third is to figure out um, how much of the radioactivity gets into the people who live nearby, um, whether they breathe it in, whether they eat it in contaminated water or contaminated food, whether it gets on their skin and it's absorbed. You know. And those models are based on a lot of theoretical assumptions. So it's a third step. The fourth step is to convert the amount that's inside you to radiation. And that does involve a lot of um, uncertainties and uh, assumptions, which basic in many ways are not justified uh, in my experience. The fifth model is to convert from the radiation dose you've got inside you to a risk. In other words, what are the chances that you will get cancer or fatal cancer from this ingestion or inhalation of these radionuclides. Now, those are five models. Of, um, I know that it's a bit much taken, um, but um, Kathy and Chelsea have a paper on this. Um, and if you ask them, they will, they will send you these five models. The trouble is that each of those models have got uncertainties involved. And what happens is that in all cases, you take the central value, because there's a spread of values in every model, you take the central value and plug it into the next model. And then you get a whole range of values. You set, take the central model from that, central result from that, put it into the third model, and then into the fourth model, and then finally into the fifth model. Now, there are huge, big uncertainties involved here. You have to. For each model, you have to multiply the uncertainty. At the end of the day, you get to the conclusion, and many people have, to just shake their heads and say, this is crazy. I mean, are we supposed to accept these as being accurate or being reliable? And my best answer to that is just to say that it's tough, it's difficult, and this is the best we can do, and we shouldn't accept the results as being gospel. We should really be humble and say that there's a lot of uncertainties involved here, a lot. Okay, that's uh, the third thing. The third thing that I'm now going to talk about San Onofre. Um, I preface my remarks by saying that I have never been to San Onofre. Um, um, uh, it's not my, uh, so I don't have specific information as to what's going on there. I'll do my best, but um, uh, if somebody calls me out and says, you're wrong, Dr. Fairley, I will eat humble pie and say, well, yes, uh, I'm, I, I accept that what you're saying is right and I'm wrong. But I think that there are three main areas of risks there at San Onofre. The first is the spent fuel cells, and there are many of them, uh, both horizontal and vertical um, at San Onofre. My understanding is that they are mostly uh, Holtec models, which means that they are not very good. They are, they're cheap. They, um, they're based on metal, which is uh, what, uh, three eighths or five eighths of an inch thick or so. Um, they're prone to cracking. Um, they're designed to be temporary, and um, they are not really robust from external attack, in my view. It would be much, much, much better for the spent fuel to be put in um, ductile cast iron uh, casks. Um, these are currently made in Germany. Uh, two common uh, names are Castor and Pollux. They are the names given to Greek de deities. Um, uh, they are extremely expensive, uh, $5 million each. Um, and they are very thick. They have, um, as I say, they're made from cast iron. And then there are, um, there's a concrete overshield. 
Now, these are able to withstand external attack. And they are, because they're about a, the walls are about a foot and a half thick, it means that, um, that, that there are no cracks or um, and they are, they're unlikely to be subject to cracks or cracking. Um, I've seen them um, and I think that they're fairly reliable. Um, the problem is of course the expense. Um, they are very expensive, but they're good. Okay, that's the first one. The second thing is the reactor shells themselves. Now, um, those are the hulks, the, um, those are the domes that we see um, at, the, uh, at San Onofre. Um, there's two of one kind and one of another. Um, now, the thing is that this, that these concrete uh, biological shells there um, contain a lot of tritium. Now, what is tritium? It's a radioactive isotope uh, of hydrogen, which is the lightest element. Now, what happens is that during the 40 odd years of the operation of the reactor, um, a, a lot of tritium is um, created inside the, the biological shield, inside the concrete. Um, where does it come from? It's, um, well, tritium is um, a tertiary fission product, and it's also an activation product of, um, of hydrogen and deuterium. Now, there's a lot of hydrogen in concrete, a lot, um, the water of hydration, and that becomes activated, basically, over the 40 years that the reactor is in operation. So when you stop the reactor running, willy-nilly, that tritium oozes out of the, of the concrete shields. And you may say, well, that's not a serious matter, Ian. Yes, it is, because the amounts that are put out are very large. Now, by my estimation, uh, from the figures that I've seen, um, in 2018, there was 25 curies of uh, tritium um, uh, emitted to air from this process. That's a huge amount of radioactivity. In Britain, we use a different unit. Um, we use becquerels, and it amounts to um, a trillion becquerels per year. That's um, a 10 followed by 12 zeros, one followed by 12 zeros um, of becquerels, which is a humongous amount of radioactivity. And that gradually, per year, that gradually uses out and it goes into the air and drifts downwind and people breathe it in. And not much is written about that, but that is true. Let me give you examples of, um, um, in Canada, there were reactors that were shut down in 1986 after Chernobyl, and they are uh, still now emitting tri radioactive tritium every year, still now. What's that? That's um, uh, 35 years after they, after the, uh, um, um, they were shut down. And here they are, they're still emitting it. Similarly, in Britain, there are reactors um, uh, at Winfrith and Trosfinith, which were closed on a long time ago. They are still emitting a lot of radioactive tritium to air. Not many people talk about this, but I think that we should um, because it is a danger. That's the second. The third is sea dumping. Now, this is something that I'm um, not confident about because I'm, uh, I don't fully uh, know about what they're doing uh, in the decommissioning works at uh, San Onofre. But my understanding is what they do is they take um, radioactive components and put them into large tanks of water. These, these radioactive components are extremely radioactive and they put them into um, large tanks of water. And um, what they have to do is they have to break down these components so that they can be shipped across the United States with transport regulations. 
And you do that by having um, cutting up the, the components underwater by laser. Um, this is a new one on me. I, had, I wasn't aware that, that uh, lasers operated underwater, but apparently they do. Now, the fact that they are um, broken up underwater um, tells me that, that the, radio, the, the components are extremely radioactive because that's exactly what you do um, to cut down operator doses as you do your uh, work underwater. For example, when you take fuel, uh, spent fuel out of a reactor, the first thing you do is you put it into a, a very large spent fuel pool. Um, and uh, that's to keep the radiation levels down because spent fuel is, of course, highly radioactive. Now, when that happens and they take the radioactive components out and ship them away, there's still water inside the tanks and they dump the water into the Pacific Ocean at weekly levels, weekly um, uh, intervals. Now, we don't know what the concentrations are of that water. We just don't know. Um, the, we understand that um, San Onofre gives us useless data, like what the, um, what the dust levels are. Well, that doesn't, that's irrelevant. What we need to know is what the, the concentrations of the radioactive um, material is in the water. Um, and until we know that, we really can't say very much. If I may ask a question by the surfers, is it safe to surf at San Onofre? My response would be, well, it would be better for you to earn inside a caution, surf elsewhere. Um, so those are the three main areas that I see risks arising at San Onofre. Um, I'm, a, I'm very conscious of the fact that I've talked in generalities um, and it's difficult for me to nail down and give you um, quantified risks. Um, mainly because we, we don't have them. Nobody has them. Um, but what we can do is um, we can make um, rough uh, estimates, or not, not so much estimates, but we can give you an idea of the dangers involved. Now, the final point that I want to turn to is, well, what can we do about all of this? Um, well, the first thing is that to inform ourselves. And that's what we're doing here today. I should say tonight, because it's, <laughs> it's nine o'clock here in the UK. Um, and a good source would be to look at um, information provided by uh, um, the foundation that is presenting us here, or to go to the website of Beyond Nuclear in Washington, DC. And a good bunch of people there, great bunch of people. And they have a lot of sources of information which you can download. You can go to my website, ianfairley.org, um, uh, and um, on it I have sources of information and some of my lectures as well, and um, some really good books to read on the, to on the topic, um, which you might find of interest and in, in help. I have to say to you, beware. Radiation and its risks is a complicated area. And once you embark on this, you'll find that the learning curve is long and it's steep. But don't let that put you off. Um, I've done it and you can do it too. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, my advice is this, that pregnant women or lactating women or women of childbearing age in other words, women who intend to have a family, shouldn't live near San Onofre. Definitely, if they live um, uh, closer than three miles, they shouldn't. They should move away. Now, I'm aware that that might cause distress to people. And I'm sorry if it does. But in my view, it's better to be aware of the dangers than to live in ignorant bliss. It really is. And my advice, by the way, is not just to 
to women, but to children as well. All children, well, even teenagers, um, below the age of, say, 18, shouldn't really be living um, close to San Onofre. That means within three kilometers. One other thing I would add is that that people who have gardens within three, within three miles shouldn't really eat the produce of the gardens. Don't eat your vegetables. Um, don't eat any wild berries. Don't eat mushrooms. Don't eat any honey from hives within three miles of the reactor. It's just not safe. Now, another thing we could do is we could, um, and I've heard about this from, um, from uh, Kathy and Chelsea, is continue putting up signs. Um, there are, I presume that there are signs on the beach saying, um, do not surf today because of bad weather or um, do not surf because the high tides or whatever it may be. Um, pin your own sign up saying um, the water in the sea is likely to be contaminated with radioactivity from songs. Just say that. Um, it is difficult to be exact, uh, uh, to be precise about the level of risk, but we advise you um, to surf elsewhere. And make it simple. And then say for further information, dot, dot, dot. Um, um, some people might say, uh, Dr. Ferry, that's illegal. Well, um, that'd be a new one on me. Um, I, for example, I understand that uh, so San Onofre um, are very upset about people putting up signs. Well, so they should be. Uh, that shouldn't stop you from putting up signs. Fifthly is potassium iodide tablets. These are tablets which, um, if you have an accident, a nuclear accident, San Onofre and large amounts of radioactive iodine are put out, um, then it um, blocks the iodine uptake to your thyroid gland. Now, a couple of points here. Um, I think that these should be pre-distributed to all people within, say, I'd uh, say, what, a 30 mile radius around the plant, um, more if you wish. Um, um, and with clear instructions about what to do in case there's an emergency. Now, the emergency I'd be thinking of would be if there was some kind of attack um, on the spent fuel uh, containers. That, would, that could release radioactive iodine into the air. And uh, I'm not trying to scare people, but that could happen. Um, now, um, the, the key point to take into account here is that People who live near the sea, um, particularly adults, and, um, that the uptake of radioactive iodine isn't a serious problem because um, they live by the sea. The, if they eat a, a normal diet with seafood and crustacea, for example, um, their thyroid, can, thyroid glands are likely to be well stocked with iodine. It's the children that you have to protect because they are, their, their glands are growing. They're always on the lookout for iodine and they'll pick it up. And so you really have to protect the kids. That means you have to pay very careful attention to the dosage, in other words, how much to give to the children. But if you are given um, uh, the packs, they will have clear instructions about how much to give. Finally, I've been asked about this uh, political activity. Well. Difficult for me to say this very much, but I am aware that a former governor of California, a guy called Jerry Brown, is a very good guy in this. Um, and I hope that somebody would be approaching him um, to uh, ask for help. I'm not sure what kind of help he could give, but it's a possibility. Um, now I'm gonna leave it there. Um, uh, and I'm going to start trying to answer some of your questions. Thank, Thank you, you Ian. Thank you, Ian. It's so nice to hear from a scientist of conscience. 
Um, we have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, the first one we have is uh, from David Lowry. Should citizens have confidence in the international radiation standards set by the B BEIR 7 phase two health risks from exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation and the United Nations scientific community on the effects of atomic radiation committees. Should we, should citizens have confidence in the beer studies and the UNSCARE committees studies, the United Nations UNSCARE committee? If, yeah. if, not, if not, if not, yes, if, why not? Okay, yes. Go on. If not, what? If not, why not? <laughs> right. Um, it's slightly difficult. The Beer 7 report, um, which is a report of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, came out about 2008, I think, maybe 2009. It's quite good. It doesn't actually pose risks as such. Um, in the sense of limits or acceptable limits. What it does do is it says, these are the risks. Um, I would, um, I've got a copy of Beer 7 report on my shelves and I would, it's not bedtime reading, but it's fairly good. It does, for example, make it quite clear that women are more uh, sensitive to radiation than men, which is quite good. Now, the other organizations, um, are, have a bit of a question mark. We all, we all should take into account that the various international bodies have got a vested interest in playing down the risks of radiation. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the honest truth. Um, for example, um, if we take uh, UNSCARE, um, um, they are basic, that's a um, based in the same building as um, uh, WHO and, and, and uh, IAEA. Um, they have a, a past track record of being economical with the truth. Okay. By that, I mean, they've been not giving the full story or they've been hesitant about telling people what the real risk level of risks are. There's an organization called the International Commission on Radiological Protection, ICRP, um, which does set safe limits. Um, and um, I don't have much faith in that organization. I regard it as being a, a trade body, a trade body for radiation. Mm. And for example, the trade body for asbestos or the trade body for tobacco, um, they don't, they aren't really very good about coming out and telling you what the real situation is. Um, so I say to people, do your own studies and form your own thoughts on what the real level of risks are. It isn't easy, but um, it's better that you do that. Um, I have serious differences of view with ICRP and with UNSCARE and with uh, IAEA. Um, and I tend not to um, pay close attention to um, uh, their recommendations. I'm sorry, you, you may think, well, this is, um, this will put you in a bit of a, a difficult position. Who do we believe? Do we believe these international bodies or do you believe Dr. Fairley? And yes, it, it is difficult. But let me give you a couple of examples where um, I think that the international uh, bodies have got it completely wrong. One is the, that um, when they transfer the risks which are observed um, from the Japanese bomb survivors, they, um, which is where we get uh, risk factors from, they arbitrarily divide those risks by two to make recommendations for what the acceptable limits are. What? Yes, they divide the risk by two. Now that is profoundly uh, unconservative. It's, um, it's a flout 
uh, completely flouting the, the precautionary principle, they should be doing the exact opposite. That's one thing. It's, these are graphs, by the way. So, sorry to lapse into the um, lingo, but that's um, what it's about. The second thing is that they refuse to recognize the huge amount of evidence showing that tritium, which is features heavily here, um, is far more dangerous than they recognize. Um, so those are just two little two areas where um, they've got it wrong and they refuse to admit that they that that's the case. Um, okay. Um, okay. So I've given you the reasons. This, that's a long. There's a long story here, and um, I'm quite willing to engage in in, uh, in correspondence and to point people in the right direction to read which books to read. Okay. Fantastic. Our second question today, much of the drinking water for Oceanside, which is a city in North County, San Diego, and North County near San Onofre is reverse osmosis seawater. Since tritium water cannot be separated, the tritium level increases in our drinking water from San Onofre discharges combined with releases from Fukushima. How can we stop this impact on our intake of tritium? You know, I'm I'm just learned this for the first time. This is crazy. You should they should not be using seawater to get their water. It's too certainly the seawater from near San Onofre. It's just too dangerous. Um, so basically, it may well be that you have to use underground aquifers or deep wells or whatever, uh, but obtaining um, drinking water from contaminated seawater by using reverse osmosis is, is, is plumb local. It's just, uh, well, if I was being diplomatic, I'd say it is quite unacceptable. Thank you. Number, our third question today, Michael Hetz asks, should I speed when I drive past San Onofre nuclear gener um, nuclear waste dump on the five, which is Highway 5, to lower my exposure time. At what distance from the plant does the exposure get dangerous? <laughs> well, that's, it's, um, no, I, I don't think you should speed up and um, break the speed limits um, on Highway 5. <laughs> um, but the second part is a more serious question, and it's difficult to answer it. Essentially, the further away you go from San Onofre, um, the lower the concentrations in air. Um, all I can say is that there are there is a pile of studies showing um, that people who live within five kilometers, which is three miles, of the nuclear power stations in a wide variety of countries around the world get cancer, particularly the kids, they get leukemia. So if you're within three miles, uh, it's serious. That's why I recommended that uh, pregnant women, lactating women, children, women who expect to have a family should not live within three miles of the plant. This is not to say that suddenly there's, a, there's an invisible barrier and beyond three miles, everything's hunky-dory. No, it just means that, but you have to give some sort of guidance and Beyond that, the risks are lower, okay? It's the best I can do. Thank you. At this time, no nuclear reactor site has a dry transfer facility to handle dry storage casks. How important are the pools as an option for waste storage in the event of a failing canister? The spent fuel pools. Yeah, yeah. Well. If somebody were to ask me, what do we do with failing canisters? I'm afraid I don't have an answer. Um, in Britain, um, what they do is they put it back into the, um, the spent fuel storage pool, but that contaminates the, the, mm -hmm. the storage pool. So it's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, we should have thought about these problems before <laughs> we embanked embarked on building 100 plus reactors in the United States. 
And that may sound like a, a very rough uh, sentence to hand out, but um, um, we really have to start thinking about uh, we'll have more intelligence when we're choosing our energy policies. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very famous Royal Commission in Britain, which came out in 1978, which said that we, these are uh, lords in the House of Lords, basically, who said, um, we should not embark on a program of nuclear fission unless there is a surefire method of dealing with long lived wastes. That's what it said. Mm. And that's a clarion call for all environmentalists because that's exactly what we should be doing. And um, there isn't one. People may say, well, there's what about the one in Finland? Then it's true that the, the Finnish authorities are building uh, an underground waste facility, which is still hasn't been licensed, by the way, it's still not finished. Um, but that is for one country, it's for Finland's reactors alone. And um, it's a horribly expensive, um, uh, billions of dollars. And um, um, a number of studies have worked out that it's, it's gonna cost more to build this facility um, and operate it than the actual money that was made from selling the, the nuclear electricity mm. from the fuel that's in, inside the um, repository. Did you get that? Because in other words, it's, it, the whole thing is, is useless. I mean, in the yeah. sense that it costs more to deal with the spent fuel than the energy that you got out of it. Um, Mm -hmm. the sales from the energy you got out of it, mm -hmm. which is begs the question, why, why nuclear in the first place? Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there were, pe if this is our next question, if there were to be an accident, how can residents in the fallout zone be prepared? Um, have their potassium iodide tablets ready, um, particularly for the kids. Um, difficult. You could ask the um, the state or uh, the feds if there are what the evacuation plans are and study them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in my experience, most uh, municipalities, um, most governments. Have, don't, either don't have any evacuation plans or very poor ones, very rudimentary ones. This is a serious matter. Let me give you an example of what happened in 1979 at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, where there was a um, United States biggest nuclear accident. Was that the state, um, the governor, uh, put out um, an advisory saying that. Um, pregnant women or women with, with, with young children should now um, leave in an orderly fashion um, and go in the, um, the, the southeast direction, or in other words, away from the plume. They expected 5,000, this would have applied to about 5,000 people. And do you know what happened? There were massive traffic jams in every direction and over about a hundred, an estimate, 160,000 people, this is a, a rural area, um, were jammed in massive traffic jams, 160,000 people. In other words, mass panic. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us we have to really think hard about um, what we should do in, in the case of an emergency. Every situation will be different, um, but somebody has to sit down and think it through. Um, and this would have to happen in, in the area around um, uh, San Onofre as well. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Our next question, Ali McNally asks, is there any other method of protection other than the potassium iodide to protect our health? The short answer is no. Okay. 
Next one, um, the esteemed Dr. Tom English asks, couldn't the Monte Carlo approach be used to couple all five models? Yes, um, um, you could use the Monte Carlo approach, which is, it's a rather um, glitzy way of dealing with uncertainties. Um, you could, but even then, the, the uncertainty range would still be huge. That's a short answer. Thank you. This is an interesting one. On March 8th, 2019, Southern Cal Edison songs wrote on Twitter that, quote, there is no credible scenario in which anyone would be harmed by the spent fuel at San Onofre, unquote. Do you agree with this statement? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> I mean, how they could make that statement is, is very difficult to believe. Um, they really, um, I would, uh, that is a misleading statement and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't take any credit of it. Okay. Um, next question. What are the effects of the radioactive waste at nuclear power plants? What are the effects that nuclear radioactive waste at nuclear power plants can have on young children regarding the waste? Well, it's the radioactive material inside the waste, i.e. The, the radioactive isotopes inside the waste that cause the damage. And um, they affect children like they affect adults, except that the children are far more sensitive. Um, and what does that mean? It means that um, for somatic cells in the body, it can result in cancers throughout the body. It could be solid cancers or it could be blood cancers. In particular, blood cancers, um, leukemias, for example, or uh, cancers of the lymphatic system, lymphomas. Um, and it also could result in genetic effects further down the line if the radiation effect hits on the genetic cells. But it's not just cancer, I emphasize this. Um, more evidence is now coming out from the Japanese mole survivors showing that it's cardiovascular diseases and strokes are equally um, as uh, a result as cancers. In other words, um, we should really be doubling the risks of, of radiation rather than half them, because we we, have, we really should take into account increased levels of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Yes. And we the next question, Dr. Ruth Strauss asks, the Diablo Canyon reactor north of Los Angeles is old and probably has corroding and rusting pipes. The government has sent no one to regularly inspect. Advocates are doing a great job. What more can we do? Do you believe that these US reactors are an accident waiting to happen? I would say that the, the older the reactor, the riskier they are. Um, uh, are they an accident waiting to happen? If we're unlucky, yes. Um, um, it's, it's very difficult to paint such a black picture for all nuclear reactors in the United States. I think that uh, once reactors are, have reached 30, we should be uh, closing them down. Um, the point is that, that the alternatives are abundant, plentiful, much safer, um, very quick to implement, and here's a clincher, far less expensive than mm. existing nuclear reactors. So in my mind, if you compare the existing safe alternatives with a risky old reactor, uh, um, there's no question that we should be closing down the old reactors. And indeed, it's not an issue of what I think. The, the older reactors are being closed down because they're extremely un uneconomic to operate. Thank you. 
Dr. Fairley, we are presently five minutes before one o'clock and we've got so many eager questions here. Are you willing to bear with yes. us for another 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah. I may go pour myself a drink and pour <laughs> myself again with all Please. these questions. No, no, Please no, no, no. do. Rather, uh, I'd rather try and answer them. Um, Go on, let's, let's, let's do our best. I'm gonna shorten my answers. Um, okay. Um, okay, perfect. Um, next question, James Heddle wonders if a hot cell wouldn't be absolutely necessary in dealing with the repackaging into thick casts, yes. casks from the thin halter canisters and dealing with failed canisters. Could be. Depends on how big your um, facilities are. Um, uh, most the, the the little shells that uh, that you're talking about tend to be for laboratory work. Um, um, I'm not sure that there are any big enough to be able to deal with the kind of situation that's being envisaged here. Next question. Okay. We have Dr. Ken Bussler here today, and um, he says, I agree largely with what was said today, but there are radioactivity measurements in the ocean off San Onofre and reports from songs on levels in liquid discharges. Surfrider has links to these data. Levels of cesium-137 are similar today off San Onofre to up and down the California coast and lower than in the 1960s when most of this cesium was delivered as fallout from atmospheric nuclear testing. What are your thoughts on this comment, Ian? Um, it's true that the sea is, has contained small amounts of, of cesium-137. And it's true that um, there were much higher levels in the 1950s and 60s as a result of atmospheric bomb tests. Um, my comment would be that this doesn't justify us dumping more into the sea. Yes. Sorry, that's the way. I'm an environmentalist. I take the view we shouldn't be dumping radioactivity into the sea. Now, it's true that in many situations, the um, level of radioactivity in the sea is very low. Um, therefore, we have an approach which is called dilution here, going on because there's a huge volume of water in the sea, obviously. Mm. But as an environmentalist, I say dilution is not the solution to pollution. Thank a you. Lot of, a lot of oceans there, but uh, uh, you got to make a stand, and that's the way I look at it. By the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, I have uh, I differ from many of the excellent publications put out by Ken Busser. He's one of the one of the good guys, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification. Maury Wolfson asks, if civilization were to completely break down, leaving no nuclear priesthoods to stop meltdowns of the world's nuclear reactors, would the results be akin to Chernobyl's? Oh my God. <laughs> it's difficult to answer that one. Um, it's true that I agree with the, the phrase nuclear priesthood, nuclear priesthood is, because they do um, uh, tend to act that way. Um, um, and they are um, a closed bunch of uh, scientists who basically speak to themselves. Um, it's difficult to understand because, because the science is ferocious. I've tried to give you some idea of it, but uh, it is difficult. Um, there are very few. There are very few scientists who speak out of that close community. They're called mavericks. <laughs> I'm one of them. And uh, but um, by the way, I call myself a citizen scientist. Okay. And there are a few people like us. Um, there are a few in the United States. They're good people. They really are. Yeah. Um, but we are in a very small minority compared with the, the, the thousands of uh, nuclear scientists. 
uh, who get uh, have got very very high salaries and who are treated by governments all over the world. What, what, if they were to go, uh, I, I couldn't answer that question. Mm. Too difficult. Uh, JT on our call asks, what are your thoughts on new nuclear technology? For example, advanced reactors or small modular reactors? They call them SMRs, right? My, when I heard about SMRs, the first thing I thought was simply more radiation. Let's go on to the next question. Great. Tara Covington asks, and this is very um, important because Fukushima is debating, or they've actually decided to release a million tons of radioactive water over the next 30 years, how we're going to deal with this. How might Fukushima or other nuclear reactors impact the US West Coast if a major atmospheric release event occurs? I use I presume from that you're saying if um, these million tons of water were to be um, dumped into the ocean um, from Fukushima, what would be the impact in the west coast of the state? And I would say very little. Okay. Um, I could go say more, but I'll just leave it there, okay? Okay, great. Um, from Susie L. Is there a quick way to explain why people of differing opinions on nuclear energy prefer to use the terms radiation hormesis or nonlinear threshold, LNT, no linear threshold? Uh, why they prefer to use the word hormesis, are you saying? Yes. Well, um... It's a matter of history. Um, back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, um, it was observed in cell studies that if you gave um, people, uh, gave the, the cells, not people, not the people, cells, um, um, little bits of doses, and then followed up by a, what they call a, a, a tickle dose, and followed that out by a big dose. And compared that with people who just got the big dose, mm. the, the former people who got the tickle did better, the cells did better. And they call that effect hormesis. Mm -hmm. Now, um, unfortunately, um, the people who did these studies, radiation biologists, and I'm one of them, by the way, I am a radiation biologist. Well, um, we realized that this was very similar to many other uh, situations, for example, chemicals. Um, if you um, give people a little bit of benzene and then a, later on a huge dump of it, the people and compare that with people who just got a big dump, that the people who got the, the small amount first do better. Now, um, it probably has to do with the learning sound. But the, the thing is for radiation protection, which is what we should be concerned about, this has absolutely zero implications. Um, it's useless to talk about this because for a start, we are all subject to background radiation, all of us. Mm -hmm. And so, so what is, my response to Hermesis is, so what? Mm. And that's what we should do. We should just say, so what? And by the way, it was not just me. Um, Beer Seven said the same thing, roughly. And Unscare have said the same thing as well. And WHO as well. Mm -hmm. So um, this hormesis thing, uh, it's, um, it's a lot of nonsense. By the way, LNT, which is a linear no threshold theory of radiation risks, is a big deal. And there's a huge amount of evidence, not from cell studies, from, from human epidemiology, which is what counts, mm -hmm. that, um, that um, it's the LNT is the model that we should use for estimating radiation risks. Okay, Thank next you. question. Uh, Katie Day shares that Surfrider is working with Dr. Bussler and Woods Hole Oceanographic 
institution to sample the beach water at San Onofre before and during and after these radioactive water releases. At this point, they'll only, Woods Hole will only be able to test for cesium levels. Do you know of other opportunities to, to conduct broader isotope testing of collected samples? Well, there are other uh, uh, laboratories that will do tests for other various radionuclides, uh, including tritium. Um, although tritium is a bit tricky. Um, but um, uh, yeah, uh, there are others. Um, uh, my feeling is that um, uh, concentrating on one nuclide alone, uh, it may be. Uh, the first step, but I think that in future analysis that we should really be looking at other nuclides as well. Thank you. And the, this is probably for, for the time being our last question because the audience questions have slowed down. But, and of course we end on a very complex question here <laughs> by Roger Johnson, Dr. Johnson. Edison keeps downplaying the risks uh, so, and Edison is Southern Cal Edison. They are the utility that is part owner of the San Onofre nuclear power plant now being de decommissioned, sorry. So Edison keeps downplaying the risks associated with radiation escaping from small cracks and leaks. They say that there is no motive force to spread the radiation beyond the plant's boundary to populated areas. Can you comment on how radiation spreads and how far and wide it would spread with these three very different scenarios. Tiny cracks and slow leaks from aging canisters, a canister breach from overheating or structural failure, or a canister being blown by high explosives. Um, <laughs> we could be here all night answering those three questions. Um, um, it sounds as if I'm, I'm avoiding it, it's not, but um, I would have to be, um, I'd have to make statements, qualify them, and explain the qualifications, which takes a long time. Mm -hmm. In all three scenarios, <laughs> um, the air travels round about them and they, the air travels to neighboring localities. It's easy peasy, I mean. <laughs> But I don't understand why SoCal doesn't understand the fact that air currents can can take um, radionuclides and, and transport them quite long distances. It's quite simple. How much uh, is transported? In other words, what the concentrations are, well, we'd have to look at it in, in much more detail than I'm saying right now. But uh, yes, it will work. Uh, that does happen or would happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, um, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. We are indebted to your um, willingness to share your uh, wisdom with us. Before we close today, I would like to, um, we have a page coming up with a screen share here. And um, I would just like to, to note to all of the participants today that we have several upcoming virtual events that we would like to share with you. The first Wednesday, December 9th at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time will be an interview with the filmmakers of Radium Girls. The second, Friday, December 11th at 1130 a.m. Pacific Time, Coalition for Nuclear Safety uh, will present have a presentation by Eric Epstein of Three Mile Island Alert and EFMR Monitoring. So look forward to that. Third, SLF Samuel Lawrence is planning a technical panel forum in the new year with international leaders. This is very exciting. Stay tuned for this as well. And um, we are presently in our year end, Samuel Lawrence is presently in our year end fundraising campaign through December 31st. A reminder that your support is what makes this work possible. Please consider making a donation at samuellawrencefoundation.org today so we can continue to provide expert webinars like today's program. 
you can go to SLF's donate page, Samuel Lawrence donate page on the website and give a gift of cash or stock. Um, most importantly, the Coalition for Nuclear Safety and Samuel Lawrence Foundation extends our extreme gratitude for, for Ian, to Ian for making himself available to us today and sharing his wisdom with our community. Thanks also to SLF staff and the coalition for their collaborative efforts to bring about this forum.